We start with thoughts of goodwill to clear the decks. Any issues we may have had with people during the day. Get them out of the way. Because you're trying to give the mind a place it can settle down in right here, right now. And you don't want those attitudes to be getting in the way. If you're worried about issues in the future, remind yourself the best way to prepare for the future is to develop your powers of mindfulness, alertness, ardency right here. Because the future is uncertain. But you do know that when you're dealing with uncertain things, unexpected things, the more mindfulness and alertness you have, the better off you'll be. So you're preparing the right tools. As for thoughts of the past, There are any mistakes that you made in the past that suddenly come thronging into the mind. You remind yourself you can't go back. You can't go back and change those things. The best that can be asked of a human being is to recognize a mistake as a mistake. Resolve not to repeat it. And then develop thoughts of goodwill again for yourself, for the person you wronged for all beings in all directions. That helps to put things into perspective. Because when you start thinking about all beings in all directions, you realize everybody's done wrong things in the past. It's not just you. And that thought gets you more and more inclined to think about all the wrong things that could be done in the future, as long as you stay in this cycle of death and rebirth and karma and more karma and more karma. Maybe it'd be good to get out. How are you going to get out? Well, the exit is right here. In other words, you learn how to think to bring the mind into the present moment, where it can then put a lot of its thinking down. Now, in the beginning, you do think. After all, two, two of the factors of first level of jhana, our directed thought and evaluation. So you direct your thoughts here and you evaluate what's going on. Here again, you're using thinking to bring the mind to stillness. And sometimes you find that you can spend the whole hour thinking about the breath, the different breath energies in the body how you can coordinate them. If there's a pain someplace in the body, you can ask yourself, how can you use the breath to help with the pain? So even though the pain may stay there, you don't feel so inflicted by or afflicted by it. Other times, it doesn't take all that much thought, and the mind is ready to settle down. Get the breath comfortably, very quickly. Then you learn how to stay here. That's a different set of skills. Less thinking, but a lot of vigilance to check to see whether the mind is ready to run off someplace. It'll send its signals. Scientists have studied people who aren't aware of when they've made a decision. The decision comes to the surface of their minds after it's been made. And the scientists use that to prove that people are not really making decisions at all. It's some, made someplace down in their molecules of their nerves. But that's just a sign that their minds have lots of walls inside. They've learned how to cover up a lot of things inside. But if you get the mind really quiet, you can start seeing when a decision is made way before it becomes obvious, before it comes to the surface. And when you can detect that, then you can make whatever adjustments are needed. So you don't go with that. Either just 
reaffirming your decision that you're going to stay with the breath, or making the breath more comfortable, going back and doing a little more directed thought and evaluation, and just breathing right through wherever you sense there's a physical correlate to that thought. Otherwise, you just watch, and you learn how to watch again and again, continually. You're like a hunter. You're waiting to see when the animals are going to come. And you can't determine ahead of time when they're going to come, but you have to be ready for them at any time. Or like a sentry. Or someone up in a fire tower in a forest. You have to be quiet. You have to watch. And you have no idea when the thing you're watching for is going to come. But you do know you have to be ready to so develop that same kind of attitude. You're ready to watch. Maintain that. Protect what you've got. And as you do this, you begin to see the mind settling down even more, even more. And then there will come times when you've had a sense, okay, the mind is thoroughly rested, and it's ready to think again. The question is, what do you think about? We think about that sutta where the Buddha talks about how he got on the right path when he started dividing his thoughts into two types, the types who were going to be skillful and the types who were not. What does that mean? It means he was not looking at the content so much, he was looking where the thoughts were coming from and where they were going. In other words, he was looking at them as processes. Now that kind of thinking, or that approach to thinking, is really useful. It's in line with the Four Noble Truths. You want to see what kinds of thoughts are part of the cause of suffering, which thoughts are part of the path away from suffering. It's as if you have a factory here that's producing very erratically, sometimes good goods, sometimes bad ones, and you're trying to figure out why is that. And sometimes it'll require looking at the, the product itself. to get an idea of what could go wrong. But a lot of it has to do with going back and just looking at the machinery in the factory, looking at the workers, looking at the whole process, starting from the design of the product through the implementation and the final product coming out. That's what you want to investigate. What happens to the product as it goes out into the world? That's not the problem. The problem is, why is it that the quality control is so bad? Can you blame it on the workers? Can you blame it on the, the middle-level management, the upper-level management? Can you blame it on the materials? Can you blame it on the machinery? There's a lot to explore here. There's a lot to investigate. The investigation requires questions, of course. Just think of investigators out in the world. They have to ask questions. Other people analyze what's going wrong with a particular company. They have to ask questions of everybody in the company. But they have to ask the right questions. Here, yeah, the Buddha gives you some guidance. This particular factory is best understood under the framework of the Four Noble Truths. There's suffering in here, and there's something causing the suffering. And the Buddha gives you some indications. He doesn't say, just say, there is suffering. He says it's the clinging, the five aggregates. Okay, what are those aggregates? What types of clinging are there? You can read about them in the books, but how do you actually experience them yourself? 
here to get a sense of how the terms in the books apply to what's going on. Then there's a the question, well, what can you do to put an end to that clinging and craving? And you find that you have to take some of the things you've been clinging to and turn them into a path. Just cling to the five aggregates, that's suffering, but then there's five aggregates involved in the path. Concentration takes all five of the aggregates. Your discernment is going to require perceptions and thought fabrications. So when you come across a perception, how do you know whether it's part of the problem or part of the solution? You ask some questions. You look at its behavior. This is one of the aspects of the Buddhist teachings that is so distinctive of his approach. Looking at the behavior of those activities in the mind, the activities that we use to Try to understand the world outside. He's saying, look at those activities in and of themselves. Try to understand them. Try to understand the activities of the path. And have a sense of when your investigations are going off course. The Buddha mentions that there's a distinction among his teachings, the, dis the teachings that should be explore to see what their implications are, and the other ones that where you don't try to carry out their implications. That second category is interesting. One, it shows that the Buddha is not concerned about building a view of the world in and of itself. If he was trying to develop a consistent theory about the world, everything would have to be consistent and everything would have to be followed through with its implications. And in some cases he is talking about this is how the world works, especially this is how the world of the mind works. But other times when he has to take teachings and hold on to them as tools for making a change in the mind itself, what we might call performative teachings, like the questionnaire about things being inconstant, stressful, not self, that's meant to perform a function on your mind, to change things in your mind. That's one of those teachings where the Buddha tells people, be very careful about how far you explore the implications. When you look in the canon where, to see where the Buddha scolds people for taking some of his teachings and trying to work out the implications, it's usually around the three, what we call the three characteristics. There's a one case where one of the monks said, well, given that all feelings are stressful, and all your karma creates feelings, and it means that all actions create stress and pain. Buddha says, when you're talking about karma, you have to talk about the three kinds of feelings, pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Because after all, if you tell everybody, whatever you do is going to lead to pain, then why bother trying to be skillful? You misapplied the teaching. You've worked out implications that are not useful. You've taken a teaching that was meant to be performative, and you're trying to use it to describe. Same with the teaching of Sabe Tamanatha. All dhammas are not self. Some people take that to mean, well, the Buddha must be saying that there is no self. But then he says that anybody who tries to take that implication out of his teachings, they've gone too far. He specifically said the theory that there is no self is just as bad as the theory that there is a self. In other words, both of these things can get you tied up in knots. He calls them a thicket of views, a wilderness of views. But if the mind is ready for that teaching of sabe tamanata, all phenomena, not self, then it really can perform its effect on the mind. In other words, you it's like one of those messages that, that you would get in Mission Impossible. They say, read the message and then destroy destroy this message. Sabeta Manata. Partly 
he uses the, that partly to remind you that even if you have an experience of the deathless, it is possible to cling to that experience. You turn it into an experience, an object of the mind. So you've got to see that that's not worth holding on to. And then the sentence itself is a dhamma. If you really follow it through, it's, you've got to abandon that too. That's when you've abandoned all the aggregates, including the fabrications and perceptions that go into sabbeta manata. That's when you're free. So that's a teaching that's meant to do something to the mind, not just describe things. Get you to develop that value judgment of dispassion towards everything. But it has to come at the right time. If you're dispassionate toward everything at the beginning of the path, you abort the whole thing. So thinking, especially thinking about the Dharma, requires that you have a clear sense of how far you should go with something, some things you can carry all the way through in terms of their implications. Other things you have to take them only so far because you realize that if you take them away from what they say, they no longer can perform on the mind. Because you try to hold on to the idea that there is no self, what does that do? Well, it becomes a position that you have to argue, you have to defend against all takers. And that's certainly not going to put an end to suffering. And it becomes an object of clinging to you, too. But Sabeta Manata teaches you, okay, let go of everything else and also let go of me. So try to be very clear about how to think about things, how to think about the drama. Because you do have to think. You can't just concentrate your way to awakening, or jhana your way to awakening. You get the mind still, and then you have to develop not only tranquility, but also insight. And insight is not just a technique where you note things. Insight is where you figure things out inside. Know when to think, know when not to think. And know how to think, how far to think. And when you're thinking, it should be descriptive, and when it should be performative. That's when you become a master of your thoughts. We've lived our lives so long with our thoughts as our masters. Now it's time to turn things around. <laughs>